Whether it's morning, noon, or night, we're so glad you're taking this ride with us. I'm Michael Bloss, and I'm here with Nick Singleton. This is Pursuing Greatness. Let's go. You damn it. Welcome, everyone, to Pursuing Greatness. I'm your host, Michael Bloss, with Nick Singleton, and this is episode four with Coach Mike Swider. Wow. We uh, we actually, yeah. we, we just finished <laughs> up the interview, and uh, wow, wow. I'm So I'm sitting here and just staring at the page of notes that I took, and <laughs> what a perspective he has, and what it like obviously he has great experiences, but the, what I loved was just the, the way he thinks about um, his impact and the way he was motivated in, in his day to day and, and, and the legacy he was striving to leave each and every day. Yeah. The amount of application to life, whether it's business, whether it's music, uh, whatever it is, there, there are just so many, I would say quotable things, but, but I'd lean more towards, you know, wisdom that could be applied to every aspect of your life, covering Absolutely. everything from, you know, being a father in relationship with his family, balancing time with work and, and your family, just the perspective on life, the perspective on leading. I mean, the list goes on and on. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited for, for you guys to hear this. I'm fired up right now, Nick. I know you I are too. too. You're probably ready to run through a brick wall. I'm headed that direction. Yeah, there's a brick wall right outside my house, so I'm going to uh, run yep. through real quick. <laughs> Here, a lot of what he was saying I've heard before, but to hear it all compiled right now, and then even me being you know, a year removed from playing for him, I think I already have a different perspective on, on the things that he's saying. So really excited for for those of you that, that know him, that uh, know of him, that have played for him to be able to hear this, but also everybody listening who, who th- this is the first time you've heard, heard of him or uh, the first time you've heard him speak. Absolutely. People matter and great leaders are driven by courage. Two quick little nuggets from Coach Swider. All right, everybody, let's jump into our interview with Coach Mike Swider. Welcome to episode four. Nick and I are here with uh, Coach Mike Swider. Really excited to have him on. He was uh, recently retired, but was the head coach at Wheaton College of the football team over there. And I actually played for him. Uh, so, Coach Swider, welcome on. Great to be here, man. Appreciate it. It's an honor to be able to spend some time with you guys. Yeah, yeah. If you just want to take a minute um, and, and just introduce yourself briefly, however you'd like. Yeah. Um, as as Michael said, my name is Mike Swider. I just retired from coaching for 43 years. Um, 65 years old now. I, I spent 35, my last 35 at Wheaton. Uh, 24, the last 24 of those, I was a head football coach there. And, uh, previous to that, I spent seven years coaching at, uh, Westminster prep school in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, then I spent the 77th season at Indiana university doing my graduate work and worked with the football program there. And then I graduated from Wheaton college, uh, in the spring of 77 and, and, uh, had played there for four years and. All I ever wanted to do was coach football, and and I uh, did for 43 years, and it was a a blessing to me, and and God blessed me tremendously through it, and and hopefully I was able to make a difference in a few men's lives and inspire a few men to uh, be difference makers in our world. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Hmm. That's awesome. Hmm. It's really cool uh, for me personally to be able to to sit down with you like this, along with Nick, just having played with you. Nick and I actually had a, a brief conversation earlier today, and I told him how how it's it's. I'm really excited just to hear about your philosophy behind the leadership behind the way that you did lead as a coach throughout your time at Wheaton, and of course prior to that. And so I was able to see that that poured outward and, and put into action, but I'm excited to hear about, about what was going on behind the scenes and, and what built that for you. But before we jump into that, you've been out of coaching now for, for about a year. Hopefully you've had some time to, to reflect back on your time. 
what stood out to you most over the last year, reflecting back in your time, 43 years? In the oh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a yeah. great question. and It's easy to answer. Um, you know, you, you know, you realize the further away you get from, away from it, uh, that the wins and losses fade. You know, that's that, you know, I've had I, I've literally had thousands of emails and texts and phone calls. My wife's had me copy print copies of the text and the uh, the emails. And I have stacks of paper here in my office in my home and and uh, and the phone calls. And, you know, over the last, you know, I retired last December. And not one of them talks about the wins, losses, championships, and all those things. Not one of them. Uh, they all talk about the influence and the impact that I had and the program had on their lives. And um, I've said many, many times that wins and losses fade, your money fades, people spend it. The only thing that you leave is what you leave in people. Michael, you've heard me say many times, if one half of 1% of all my players is is a little bit of me. If one half of 1% of Michael Bloss is, is Mike Swider, then I've left something. Yeah, then I've left yeah, something that, yeah. that matters. I, I say all the time, you know, you, you know, you leave your kids money, all they'll do is spend it. You know, you leave wins and losses and, and attention. All it does is people forget it. But when you leave a legacy, when you leave something in somebody, it, it transcends your life. And then they pass it on and then they pass it on and then they pass it on. And then you, you impact culture. Yeah. Um, you know, wins and losses, and I trust me, nobody wants to win more than I did. And if I was in the business world, nobody wanted to make more money than I would because I'm a competitor. But it's when those things become and start to consume you that you start prostituting yourself. Um, so many times I was in the office and, and we'd be faced with a decision, whether it was a football decision or it was a program decision or a personnel decision or a person decision. I never asked the question, will it help us win? I always ask the question, is it right or wrong? Yeah. You, know, you always, is it, if it's right, you do it. If it's wrong, you don't. If it's about eternity, you do it. If it's about people, you do it. Um, we'll eventually win. You know, winning is just a byproduct of doing the right things. And if I, I just spoke to a group of businessmen just yesterday, I do a lot of motivational speaking. And I told them if I was in the business world, I, I'd get my group of guys say, don't ever ask yourself, will it help us make money? Ask yourself, is it right or wrong? If it's right, do. If it's wrong, don't. Mm. But the problem is so many times, you know, you ask yourself what help us win and then you prostitute yourself to win. You compromise everything you hold dear to make money and to do those things. And so you have realized that that's so true now that I've retired that, you know, you realize that uh, what you've done for people is the only thing that matters. What you leave in them is, is it all that matters? It really is. And, and um, you know, and that's, that, that cause has got to drive you, you know, and that, that motivation has got to be people centered. Um, my son, Mikey, you know, I retired and, and he says, you know, dad, he, he's, he's big into numbers and stats. And he says, dad, you were a head coach for 24 years. He said, your winning percentage was almost 81%. He said, Nick Saban's been a head coach for 24 years. His winning percentage is 79%. He says, you got a better winning percentage as a head coach than Nick Saban. He said, he made millions. You never made a wooden nickel. He said, but you know what he said? But he said, Dad, I was part of it. And I know because I played with guys, he said, but you changed lives. Mm. You changed lives, Dad. And that's all that matters. And you know the great thing? You won too. And uh, so I, I'm starting to realize that more and more that, you know, the winning and losing is great. And trust me, if I were to continue to coach, we'd continue to win. But it's bigger than that. It's so much bigger than that. And that's what I've realized now that I've retired more and more every single day as these calls come in, these letters, these texts, these emails, even you, Michael, you know, as you, you text me a few times to get this set up, you know, what you took, what you took from the program was so much bigger than anything else. It was, you've, you've encouraged and inspired me already because of what it's done in your life. And, and I've gotten that and I've gotten that from thousands and, and not only from players, I've gotten it from wives of players, from parents of players, from sons and daughters of players, <laughs> yeah, I've got, yeah, not just absolutely. from the player, but these other people say, I got it from a daughters of players saying you made a difference. In my dad's life, sons of a player, wives mm -hmm. of a player. I've had wives say I never would have married my husband if he went a Wheaton football player. And, uh, wow. you know, wow. so you, you get that and you just go, holy smokes, man, this is, this is a big deal.
Yeah, that's awesome, Coach. Well, I wanted to hop on here and ask you something as well. So, Michael and I were just talking before this too, and even for me, so we were talking about how he has an interesting perspective, obviously knowing you pretty well and, and being coached by you. And even for, for me, for myself, being living right around the corner from you, living right down the street from Wheaton College, and, and now my, my younger brother, Sam, obviously playing for you for a year uh, or a couple of years, whatever it was. But so even, even me, I have an interesting, a different perspective on, I know you a little bit more and I've heard a little bit more about you than probably most of the people that are going to hop on and, and listen to this podcast. And so you shared a lot of amazing things and, and just kind of your, um, as you reflect back, kind of what you think about your time, um, I guess the question is in short, what was it that got you to that point um, of viewing your role as a coach in the way that you view it now? Well, there's no question. It was, it was my dad. My dad was an amazing man. Uh, you know, in the world's eyes, he was probably nothing. Never made more than $30,000 in one year of his life. You know, he was part of the greatest generation. Um, he was a World War II vet, you know, grew up during the Depression and Six months after he graduates from high school at age 18, you know, he signs up and he's overseas, you know, in a matter of six months. You know, he grew up having nothing and fought as if he'd been given everything. Mm -hmm. Amazing generation. They're all dead or going to die soon. Um, and he came back from his service in World War II, put himself through school, and then spent almost 40 years coaching and teaching the Chicago public school system. That's it. It's, that's an amazing thing. <laughs> and, and then he retired and he died six months after he retired. He got cancer. And at, since he's died and at, at his funeral and then since, the number of people that have come up to me and said, man, your dad made a difference. Your dad impacted me. And then even while he was coaching, the number of people that, you know, that I remember getting on a bus, a, a coach bus that was taking us to a game one day, and the guy goes, you're coach, why do you coach here? He says, you're, I played for your dad. Wow, he says, your dad changed my life. Hmm. And I bump into people, whether it's a guy who's driving a bus to our Wheaton College to a football game. I mean, it, it's the number of people that have just run into me over my years. Even when I was in Atlanta, I just went, this guy was just a high school football coach in the city of Chicago, man. And look at the difference he has made. And the general response was, I said, well, what was it about that? He said, and they would just give short phrases like he cared. He challenged me. He confronted me. He encouraged me. He inspired me. He put me in my place. He gave me hope. And I just went, holy smokes, man. That's 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 a difference. That's an impact. And, um, you know, and it's you know, he was a dad that was just amazing. He told me three things every every night before I went to bed. He told me three things. He and he told me him all the time. He said, God loves you. I love you. And I love your mother. And he said, those three loves will never change. Never. And they never did. And I tell my three I tell my three children the same thing, that God loves them, that I love them and I love their mother. There's a lot of kids growing up that are 0 for 3 in those three areas. They're 0 for 3. Mm. They're 0 for 3. Mm. 0 for 3, and that's why we need coaches. You can imagine how different our culture would be as if every kid was as rich as I was, and I had nothing. Financially, I had nothing. But I had a diet that every day reminded me that God loved me, that he loved me, and he loved my mom. And, wow, that, that made a difference. And like I said, there's, there's so many kids growing up today that none of those things are happening in their life. And the insecurity it, it, it promotes is unbelievable. And then they try to, they find meaning in, in other things and other people. And, you know, that destruction of our nuclear family is, is, is that's, that's the problem in our culture. You can say anything you want about anything, mm -hmm. but it's the destruction of that nuclear family and are pushing back against the, the, uh, the, 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 the message of salvation and that God, Jehovah is, is King and ruler. You know, and, and uh, anyhow, to put a long story short, my dad inspired me. He inspired me in, in no uncertain terms and said, no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, make a difference. And I saw that played out in his life and and uh, and I've tried to do the same in my own and try to 
instill that in my own in my own children. And um, hey, here's the bottom line, guys. You got two days that are guaranteed in life. Okay, two days. This day and that day. <laughs> this day is today. And that day is when Jesus comes. Now, I don't care who you are. I don't care what faith you come from. I don't care anything. Every human being breathing right now has only got two days. You got two days. You got today. And you got the day when you see Jesus and the backside of that day is eternity. You better live today in light of that day. Because that's all you got. And here's the problem. We don't do it. We act as if that day is never going to come. And we think tomorrow is going to come. And we think the next day is going to come. So we think the next day is going to come. You know what? It ain't guaranteed. Nothing's guaranteed but today and that day. And so the best thing we can do, if you're going to live a life of inspiration, live today in light of that day when you're going to see your maker on the brink of eternity. And he's either going to say, welcome home, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you master over many. Or he's going to look you in the eye on the brink of eternity. And he's going to go, I never knew you. Hmm. Well, you know, make a difference. You know, he, yeah, he, in, yeah. in that same guy, it said the two greatest commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, make a difference in somebody's life. And that's what you do today. And then if you get tomorrow, you get tomorrow. But do that today because that other day, it's around the corner, man. And that's yeah. what's inspired me. I love the, uh, I love the simplicity to that, too, uh, the way – the way that you spoke to it, the way that you spoke about uh, your your father's impact that he had, and, and people would just tell you those phrases, um, as well as just just waking up each day looking to make a difference in someone's life. And I guess that that leads me to the question of, uh, without a doubt, you had other opportunities, whether it's to make more money, to go to a larger program, to um, you know win win more games at a higher level per se. What was it exactly that, that kept you around and, and how did you sustain for, for 24 years and, and stay consistent? Because I think that, that was one thing for me. I was, I was blessed to be around at, at the tail end of, of your career. So, so what kept you around to that point? Well, I think there's, there's more than one thing. Um, you know, I wanted to build something that would last. I wanted to build something that would transcend me. And that takes time. You don't just... You know, I wasn't interested in just jumping this ladder and puddle jumping from here to here to here to here to here. I was inter jump, interested in building something that would last and building something with tradition and building something and staying and staying and staying. There's a book called Tender Warrior written by Stu Weber. We read it. I don't know if uh, my a couple of small groups read it. Mike, I don't know if yours did it. I talked to you a little bit about it in our senior leadership meetings. Mm -hmm. But he talks about staying and staying power whether it's in your marriage, it's in your faith, or whether it's in a job. And, and I'm not condemning those that jump, but there's something about somebody who stays. There's somebody about somebody who stays and he builds something. And he builds something that matters. Um, he stays with his family, stays with his wife. Uh, I wanted my kids to get up every day and go to bed every day and, and not worry about being jumping around. Um, and I wanted to, to have some permanence. Uh, and that was that was really, really critical. Um, you know, I wanted to to build something that when I left, OK, it would remain. I'll never forget. Um, and I don't think you do that overnight. I think you do that when you show people that through thick and thin, through highs and lows, you stay and you stay and you stay. And it's worth staying for. Um, I'll never forget. You know, after our last game, I had told my family that I was going to retire. I told them August 1st of last year. That's the only people I told. I didn't tell the school. I didn't tell anybody because I, I didn't want the thing to turn into a circus. And every Saturday, you know, the opposing coach comes across and everybody in the stand, well, that's his last game against these people since these people. And, and every game would turn into a farewell tour for Mike Swider. And, and I said, and I told my family, I said, that's, that's garbage. It's not right. It's, it's the seniors last year. It's not mine. It's the seniors. Let's not turn this into Mike Swider. Let's turn this into this football program. I said, it's never been about me and it's never going to be about me. It's going to be about our seniors and our, our team. And so, you know, you, you guys know the story, how we got beaten in that last game. I, I really believe we were the best team in the country. We had the best defense in the country, arguably one of the best offenses. We beat the national champs, you know, earlier in the year and we, we beat them resoundedly. Um, it wasn't, it, it was, it was not a, it was a decided victory. And, uh, 
you know, I really did. I said, we're, we're going to do this. And you guys know how we lost. I'm not going to go into the details. It was probably the most difficult loss I ever experienced. I've never been in a game where we hold our opponent to minus yards rushing and still lose a football game. Hmm. I mean, it's, it's just mind boggling. And you guys know how it all happened. Yeah. But, um, so after the game, I'm walking off the field and I'm so discouraged. And it's just my wife and kids, you know, ones no one. So I, you know, I look at my wife, I say, so this is how it ends. Really? This is how it ends. You know, Mikey comes running up to me and he's a passionate guy. And he prayed every single day from that day, moment, August 1st. I told him, he said, dad, I've been praying every day that God gives you a national championship. And he goes, man, I don't feel very close to God right now. Really? This is how he ends it? Really? Really, God? This is how you do it. And my wife, who never played a down of football and never was an athlete in her entire life. But an amazing perspective. She's walking off the field holding my hand and with my son, my daughter, my other son. And she looks at Mikey and she looks at her. She says, you know what? God just said no. That's the only way you can explain this. Just like we say no to our children. Our children think something's really good. They want it. They want a car. They want this. They want this. And sometimes we as parents, we just say no. You know why? Because we know better. We know down the road. We see a bigger picture. And we're, you know, I'm 50 and my son's 10. And I say no. He says, why? Because I said so. How's that? <laughs> and 10 years down the road, Mikey and Justin have come up to me and say, now I know. Justin has three children. He goes, dad, I'm doing the same thing you did. The older I get, the smarter you get, dad. <laughs> and and the same thing happens there. And God just, and the same thing with my maker. God just said no. And I got to trust him because he loves me. The same thing I would tell my sons and my daughter. No, I love you. Trust me. I know what I'm doing. And and that's what God did. And, and then my wife, she made another statement. I got two things that will help you here. She made a statement and she goes, um, you know, Moses took Israel out of the Egypt, through the, Israel, uh, through the desert for 40 years, highs, lows, difficulty, and brought them to the edge of the promised land. And Moses didn't get to take Israel into the promised land. He said, no, that's Joshua's job. Well, man, I, and when I got to Wheaton, it wasn't the state of Wheaton football now, trust me. It, they had won four games in four years right before I got there. You know, and, and, and now you're a national power and all these great things, whatever, yada, yada, yada. And then all of a sudden we're on the brink of, of what in the world says is the greatest. And, and God said, no, someone, and she says, someone else is going to do that, Mike. And, and so we're sitting in the house that Saturday night. My kids and I, now we're back in the house. We're sitting around and everybody's bummed and because they know it's my last game and that's how we lost. And and Mikey and Justin go, Dad, come back. You're loaded. <laughs> you guys are loaded, man. Everyone's coming back. You got 10, 50 or seniors. You got 25 seniors. You got 35 guys over the age of 22. You're loaded, man. You're going to win it all. Guarantee you'll win it all next year. Can't. It's It's going to happen. And then you look like, okay, well, then the virus hits. Yeah, really? What's guaranteed? Just this day and that day, right? Yep, 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 yep. That guaranteed, really? And then my wife stepped in, too, and she goes, Mike, the greatest testimony to Wheaton football would be for them to win it the year you leave. Because you built that program to last. You built it. And, Mike, you've heard me say this. It's bigger than any one player. Players come and go. Forget it. You know, we're going to we're going to be good because the culture's good because the program's good. It's built to last. It's bigger than any one guy. It's about a cause. And she said. For them to win it without you is a greater testimony to what you've done than for them to win it with you. And I just went, whoa, smart. Lady. <laughs> That's powerful. And so, um, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's been a it's been a learning experience for me and it's been special. And um, uh, it's just it's you realize, like I said, just how how, you know, talking about leadership, how important it is for leaders to build things and not build them around themselves, but build them around a cause. And we can get into that here shortly. We got a little time left, but I just wanted to talk about causes are the greatest motivators in the world. Michael, you've heard me say it. Egos and money and fame and power are bad motivators. Build something around causes because, like I said, you know, you 
You, you pay someone, a mercenary, you pay a mercenary to fight in a war. Well, he's going to fight long enough that he, he's going to, but he's not going to fight to the death because he wants to live to spend his money you pay him. And the guy's fighting for glory. He's not going to fight for the death because he wants to live to feel the praise. But the guy's fighting for a cause. He flipping dies because the cause transcends his life. Hmm. And I wanted Wheaton football to be young men and Michael, you experience this. It wasn't about any one guy. It was about a group of guys who died to themselves, lived for something bigger, fought for that, died for that, and show how special that could be. And then to take that lesson and make the lesson of their faith, their family, whatever else they wanted to do. But let causes drive you and not personal ambition drive you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think that that's one thing I, I do want to hear more about. You mentioned leadership, but I think you've also mentioned a few times building something, you know, you don't want to just bounce around. You don't want to be uh, all over the place, but, but really being consistent, building something, building a culture, you mentioned the motivators, how to have a cause that is motivating. And fortunately I was able to see you build the cause, have, have the motivators that, that brought us to, to meetings every day, to practice, to workouts, Behind the scenes, how do you build those causes and, and how do you ingrain that in a bunch of 20-something-year-old guys like myself who, who came in and who came from different high school programs who are probably the best player on their teams who probably, I mean, I guarantee you most of it, not every single guy that, that comes in as a freshman, especially um, as a football player, has some type of ego. So how do you begin to break those down and how do you bring guys together as a team and, and really drive that cause home? Well, yeah, I mean, you get every freshman walks in, you're off, you're recruiting them. And so you say, what, well, you got any questions for me? And they go, yeah, how quickly can I start? You know, I want to play. I want to start right away. I'm 18 years old. I want to start. I want to play. You know, do a freshman play? And I said, well, listen, son. I say, you want to play. I want to win. Okay, we're, we're, not, we're not coming at this the same way right now. Your goal is to play. My goal is to win. Until your goal is to win, you'll never play. You're not going to play. Winning has got to be the goal. And you got to get every 120 guys to have their number one goal is winning. It's winning. And the team succeeding and the cause succeeding. You've got to do that until they die to themselves and put that cause up. It ain't going to happen. And, and so you say, well, then how do you actually get them to do that? And I always, I, I, I got about 10 things here to talk about, about leadership, but let me try to just, because we don't have much time, I'm sure. But I just want to whittle down, there's three things in leader, well, there's more than three things, but here are three core things. And I call it the leadership genius of Jesus. Jesus was the greatest leader of all time. The guy started a movement 2000 years ago. It's still going. Okay. And he really only was in the public eye for three years. He banged nails as a carpenter for 30, okay? He banged nails, all right? And then for three years, he, he got into the marketplace and he started teaching and preaching this new thing called Christianity. So three years on this earth, he started a movement that's still going. So what, what were the dynamics? I said there are three things. First of all, his life inspired you. You know, now he was perfect. <laughs> we can't be perfect. But the, the first thing as a leader, and Michael, you'll know this too, your life's got to inspire you. They've got to see everything you're demanding played out in your own life personally. Your life better be inspirational on every level. You better be a man of integrity. And what a man of integrity is, is what you say you live. What you demand from others, you demand of yourself. Eisenhower, probably the greatest leader of all time. Dwight Eisenhower, I've never known anybody who was president of the United States as well as a five-star general. You guys know any? I was no. president of the United States of America, and he was also a five-star general in the U.S. Army. Hmm. That guy probably knew something about leadership. <laughs> and you know what he said? Out integrity, you can't lead. Number one, whether you're a leader of anything, if your life does not match the mission, if your life does not match the values you're, you're setting up, if your life does not demand, match the rules you're putting on your players, if your life does not match what you're expecting of your players, you have no shot. Your words will ring hollow. 
People will follow you not because they want to. They will follow merely because they have to follow you. And if the title is the only thing that they're following, you have no shot to establish anything. Your life has to inspire. You've got to be a man of integrity. And a man of integrity is a man who's living the mission, who's living the cause that he's asking the players to jump on. And if they see a disconnect there, they have no shot. You have no shot to lead anything. You want to lead your family, and, and if your ego is under, and, and, and egos destroy everything. It's, they destroy everything. I'm going to write a book someday about it. And egos are, they wreck every team. They wreck every relationship. They wreck every family. It's, and, uh, and so you got you got to be a man of integrity and, and to get, and so when I tell that kid in that room, I says, you, you, you know, it's about winning, man. It's about us winning. Okay. It's not about you playing, get out of yourself and get into the team and then maybe you'll play someday. But until you get your greatest joy from us winning, you're, you're, we're not going to, you're not going to be part of this thing. So get out of yourself. And the thing I tell them too, is I tell them, Michael, you've heard me say this 10 years from now, Michael, you're going to see this. Nobody's going to ask who played. Nobody's going to ask. You're going to get together, Michael, in 10 years with all the guys in your class. My sons are doing it right now. They're, they're hanging out. They still do the whole retreats with their class, you know, 10 years out. And my son, Justin, he says, dad, nobody even talks about who played. You know, what we always say, we say two things. They say two things. We were teammates and we were good. That's all they said. We were teammates. You know what? We kicked everybody's butt. We were good, too. Nobody talks about who is a superstar. Nobody talks about who. Is, they just talk about we. That's a team, man. That's a culture. And that and then you've got in order to do that, you've got to lead with integrity. Your life's got to inspire people. My life has to inspire. They got to see my wife and my kids and my family and how I'm leading there. And if that doesn't inspire you, you have no shot, my guys. Number two, made Jesus a great leader. People matter. He didn't treat them as things. He developed relationships with people. I've said this many times, and Michael, you've heard me say it. Rules without a relationship equals rebellion. Demands without a relationship equals rebellion. Rules and demands with a relationship equals response. You take the time to develop a relationship with a young man and you put demands on him, he'll follow you. But if you don't, the guy's going to rebel in two seconds. He'll follow you only because what? He has to. I say that's why kids rebel against parents. It's why people don't follow whoever it is. They're not rebelling against a demand. They're rebelling against a lack of a relationship with the person making the demand. That's why God sent Jesus. In the Old Testament, it was just God, Jehovah, and you had to go through a high priest to talk to God. You had to kill a lamb, shed its blood, and you look at Israel as constant rebellion. There was no relationship with God, Jehovah, and God. You know what God said? I got to be, got to be a better way. You know what He did? He sent Jesus. And Nick, you and Mike, you know what? We can talk to God every day now, can't we? Amen. And, and the better our relationship, the better off we are, aren't we? The better our relationship with Jesus, the more obedient we are, isn't it? Kids come into my office all the time. They're screwing up. I'd ask them, grade your relationship with Jesus around A, B, C, or D. And invariably, they're going to grade themselves as D. Well, they're not reading the Bible. They're not praying. They're not in church on Sunday. They're not in a small group. And they're not in a service ministry. If you're in a service ministry, if you're in a small group, if you're in church, if you're reading the Bible and praying, your relationship with Jesus is probably really good. You know what's going to happen? You're going to do all the things that he asks you to do, not because you have to, but because you want to. And that's what the world doesn't get. They look at it as a do's and don'ts. Well, you guys can't do this. You can't do that. And they don't realize, you know what? No, I don't want to do that. I want to follow Jesus. And I want my players to say, I want to follow that guy. And you know why Michael Bloss wanted to follow me? Because Michael Bloss knew that I, I cared about him. He knew that. Guys would see me grab someone's face mask on a game day, pull them down to my level, and i go, son, you're not, you're not getting it done. You're better than that. Now get out there and make it happen. People in the stands would say, man, that guy's crazy. How come that kid doesn't slug that coach? Hmm. You know why? Because that same player was in my office on Thursday and we were praying because he was going through a struggle. And I sat with him for 45 minutes and prayed for him. You know, they don't get it. Great leaders understand one thing. Time spent developing a relationship is never wasted time. People follow people who know them who love them. And the only way you know that 
develop a relationship. And the third thing that made Jesus the greatest leader of all time is he washed his disciples' feet. You know what he did? He served them. He didn't want to be served. He wanted to serve. I was just talking to this businessman. They walk. I say, you should, you get a leader, walk into the office every day. And every time you walk by someone's desk, you ask them, what can I do for you today? How can I help you? Serve the people you're leading. And Michael's seen that from our coaches as well. How can I help you? What can I do for you? Let me ask you through, you two guys, this question right now. Would you follow a guy whose life inspired you, who spent time getting to know you, and who washed your feet? Would you follow that guy? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Work done, you'd follow him. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's leadership. Yeah. And yeah. you're that kind of leader, you can get people to die to themselves and live for a cause, Michael. Yeah. 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 And yeah. one thing I think of too, you, you've mentioned your wife a couple of times, you, you've mentioned uh, your two sons and your daughter. And I guess, you know, I think one thing that, whether it's coaching, business, you're building something. Obviously, that takes a lot of time. As a coach during the season, the time spent, obviously, with with just coaching duties, but but as well as building those relationships. How did how did you balance that time, and how did you maintain relationships with your family, with your wife, with your kids, and and be in a good place with them as well as building relationships with your players and with coaches. I think that time management is huge. And and so I guess my, my question with that is, is how did you do that? How did you balance that time? Well, now you're realizing why I didn't go to a different level and why I stayed at Wheaton <laughs> because I wanted to do that. Yeah. I intentionally bought a home five blocks from school, three blocks from campus. You know, you know, at lunchtime I could run home. All of a sudden, sometime during the day, my wife would say, can you run home and do something? I, I could run home 30 minutes. You know, I don't know. I don't know if you guys went to Hawthorne. Did you guys go to Hawthorne Elementary? No. I don't mean, no. They went to Hawthorne. They'd run these monster laps. They'd come, they'd come out in a PE class. They'd sometimes have to run two monster laps for time. It's around the field. Yeah. I'd run over there sometimes. It'd be like gym class at 10 o'clock. And I'd stand on the corner. Nobody would see me right on the edge of the field over at Hawthorne. And all of a sudden, they'd be running. And there goes Justin, he's running, he's, he's third grader. And he'd come around the corner. I say, go, Justin, go. <laughs> and he'd look up and he'd go, dad. And then I'd go back to school. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> it was 15 minutes, that's all it was. Well, my daughter was doing something. She was over at, you know, the junior high over here. And uh, and she'd be in a little play or something. and. And it was during the day even or, or whatever. And, and all of a sudden, I'd show up and I'd poke my head and I'd wave and give her a smile. And I'd say, Daddy loves you, man. And I'd be gone. You know, it's just, it's, it's stuff like that, that the proximity, maybe those weren't long moments, but those were moments, weren't they? Yeah. 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 Those, were, those were moments and those moments matter. And it was being able to do stuff like that. And then it was married to a, a woman that understood and said, you know, it's not, and I, I married a woman who was not high maintenance, man. She put the cause too. She loved weakness football as much as I did. She loved Jesus as much as I did. She loved our marriage. She didn't love herself. And it's critical. It's absolutely critical, you know, and it, first of all, you marry someone who's cause driven and then you do everything you can. You know, you know, the other thing is communicate. You know, it's it's building that relationship. If I get home sometimes, it's it's nine o'clock at night, ten o'clock at night, it's a long day. You go home, you fall into bed, your dog tired, and I lay down and my wife goes, Let's talk. <laughs> yeah, really? Let's talk. I've been talking the last fifteen hours. Let's talk. And I said, You talk, I'll listen. <laughs> and boom, you'll be sleeping. You'll be sleeping in two minutes. And then she nudged me, she says, No. Let's talk. Not because there was something bad happening. You know what? She just wanted to talk and keep the relationship going. You know, it's that kind of stuff. And uh, it's not volume of time. And then there were times, obviously, when you could give great volume of time as well. So, uh, yeah, proximity to, to school was huge, huge. And the ability, like I said, being at Wheaton, being the head coach, and not being at other schools where I could dart home and nobody was going to question what I was doing. Because I, my whole office, I told our staff all the time, 
I said, listen, I'm never going to question anything you do that builds your family or builds our players. You do it. God's not going to punish us. God's not going to punish us. I remember telling coaches all the time, you're watching tape. 30 minutes before practice, you're getting ready, and all of a sudden a kid comes in, and he's distraught. I said, turn the daggone TV off. I said, we're not going to get beat because you didn't watch 30 more minutes of tape. We're going to win because that kid's going to play his butt off for you on Saturday because you loved him. And the same thing goes with my wife and my kids, man. You know, if I didn't watch as much as much tape as others, and even though I put in a lot of time, Michael, there are other coaches put in more than I did. But you know what? You know it. You were my player. You played for me, man. You cut off your left leg for me. And that's why we won, because we had players that the cause drove them. Hmm. Coach, that's awesome. I I want to say, first of all, just thank you. Uh, I, we got we got one one more question, then we'll kind of wrap up um, with a final question. But uh, I just want to take a second, re- real quick, to just say thank you for for sharing your heart and sharing um, just a lot about who you are. And like I said, um, I know a little bit about you. Michael obviously knows you really well, and and um, but it's just cool to hear your thought process and your um, just the ideas behind what it is that you do and how you carry yourself. So, so thank you on that. And, and I guess my question here uh, before we, we finish up is I wanted to ask some advice. So for people listening to this and, and hearing about the way you think about things, the way you think about leadership, um, obviously translates to anything in, in life, right? It, it translates to a coach on the football field translates to a player on the football field, but also translates to, to business and to um, any person in any career can, can take something out of this talk. So I guess my question here is, uh, what's a piece of advice you have uh, given, and this is kind of a broad question, but given everything that you've shared today, um, someone who isn't in athletics, you know, someone who's in, in a business, um, leading a business, leading, leading his coworkers, What's a piece of advice you have for, for that person? Um, something that they can take out of, of this, something they can take out and, and apply to their day to day. It's a great question. I mean, I just literally just was speaking at a breakfast on Thursday morning to a group of businessmen at 7 a.m. at uh, over in Elmhurst. And, uh, you know, none of them are athletes. And I do that a lot. I do. I, I do that a lot. And Two things. First, the, the core values doesn't matter what you're leading. It doesn't matter what you're leading, Nick. It it it's it's irrelevant what you're leading. Leaders lead. And uh, but here's the thing. I, I think if I could just whittle this down to to a couple things that you could just sort of grab onto and hold on to tightly. Um, one would be people matter. Don't treat people as things. Everyone bleeds red, man. Everyone bleeds red. Everyone has feelings. They have emotions. They hurt. They get happy. They cry. They got issues at home. Everyone does. Don't treat a person as a thing. They're a person. They're a human being. Understand that and understand, which I've said earlier, that time spent developing a relationship with that person you're leading is never wasted time, ever. Ever, 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 ever. You'll never lead an organization adequately, whether it's a church or business, a hospital, whatever it is, if the people that you are leading don't know you or think you don't care. If you have no shot. You've heard me say a little bit. People don't follow titles. They follow courage and they follow someone they know. And then the other thing I would leave you with, too, is we didn't get a chance to touch on this, that and I just said it there. They follow a person they know, and then they follow courage. We'll see it all the time. Don't get me started with this COVID thing, guys. But fear is a bad motivator, okay? It's a bad, 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 bad motivator. And great leaders aren't driven by fear. They're driven by courage. Morally courageous. You answer to one guy, you answer to your maker, man. And fear, someone puts a gun to your head, you do anything. Compromise everything. Well, we find out what's important to you, man. Morally courageous. Morally courageous people. If you're going to be a great leader, you have to be that. 
And I'm telling you, as a believer, our, we we at we answer to one one guy. If we're an Agama guy, that's our maker, and that's where we get our conviction. That's where we get our principles. That's where we get our morals, and that's everything. And that goes back to that whole thing. You got two days. The great leaders. We all have two days. And you know what the great leaders? They lead today in light of that day. And they'll lead morally courageous then, won't they? You will be morally courageous if you live today knowing it's the only day you've got and the next day you're seeing God. You think peer pressure would ever, ever, ever affect you if you live like that? You think what people think of you would ever affect you if you live like that? You wouldn't even care. You live based on conviction and those convictions based on the God you're going to see on that day. So one, people got to matter. You got to treat people as people and you got to be morally courageous knowing the only, only, only person that matters, like I said, a common person, is that day when you see God. Are you living today in light of that day? Are you leading today in light of that day? If so, you'll lead with moral courage. And when you lead with moral courage, people follow you. Because people follow courage. They do. Trust me. They don't follow Twinkies. <laughs> Amen to that. And I love the application. Just the thought that it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you're doing. It doesn't matter who you're leading. Leaders lead. And, and it applies across the board. The way that, that, that Nick and I like to wrap up this show is, is just ask, ask a simple question of you. So if you if you had to choose one word for, for your journey on your pursuit of, of your greatness, whatever that looks like, obviously for everybody, it's going to look a little different. What is one word that you would use to describe the journey that you're on right now? Post-coaching, you know, you're, you're headed into a quote unquote retired life. I'm sure you're not. You're not relaxing too much. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're still getting out there and, and doing these speaking engagements and, and spending a lot of time with your kids and now grandkids as well. And uh, I pounded the bike today for 30 miles, baby. Oh, yeah. <laughs> love it. Love it. Love, love it. it. Oh, yeah, man. I'm not getting lazy and slothful. <laughs> Still doing that big core routine, too, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. So what's the one word you would use right now just to describe your your, your journey you're on? Yeah. Um, can I give you just a couple sort of things here? That's, yep. Yeah, I would say I remain faithful. I remain committed and I finished. Hmm. Faithful, committed, and I finished. Is that how great you are? Do you finish? Yeah. You yeah. finish? Yeah. And do you finish charging or you to finish running? You know, I'll leave you this. Dying's not a bad thing, man. It's really not. It's how you die. You've heard me say it, Michael. When they pick you up off the battlefield of life, were the bullet holes in your chest or were the bullet holes in your back? And therein lies your legacy. Mm -hmm. Did you die finishing? Did you die charging? Did you die committed? Did you die faithful? Or did you die a coward, fleeing, fearful? My prayer would be, if I die, man, if I go down, I die committed, faithful, charging, People say, man, when they pick him up and they put him in a casket, the holes are in his chest. Great word to end us on. Thanks again, Coach Swider, for having you on. it. It's, it's been a pleasure to uh, have this time with you and also to be able to share a lot of the, the wisdom and, and the words that, that you gave to me for, for four years of playing under you and, and be able to pass that along to, to guys like Nick, to other people who may be listening right now who – didn't have the opportunity to play for you or haven't had the opportunity to hear you speak. So it's been, it's been a real pleasure to have you on and really excited to share this. Thanks, man. I call it an honor. And it's just a, it's a blessing to see two young men are here trying to make a difference in the world. And that's what you're doing guys. That's how you do. That's how you change things, man. Be a man of influence. And that's what you're doing right now with this podcast. You're being men of influence. So God bless you for it. Thanks so much. Thanks, coach. coach. Appreciate you. You bet. God bless you guys. Have a great day. And like you've heard me say many times, Michael, stay tough and don't flinch, buddy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. All right, everybody. This is Pursuing Greatness, Episode 4 with Coach Mike Swider.